It's been thus far, and it is only going to get better and better and better because today we are going one step higher, and we're going to talk about financial freedom. Financial freedom. But I have a confession. <laughs> and my confession is, is, as I was studying and researching and praying and writing and rewriting, and preparing for this sermon, it dawned on me that I had the wrong title. I should not have entitled this subject, Financial Freedom, Exercising the Economics of Spirit, but rather I should have entitled it, Exercising the Economics of Spirit Toward Financial Freedom. Have you got it? Have you got it? Let's get, let's get it straight. Let's put the pieces in place correctly, amen? Because as you exercise, as, as you exercise the economics of spirit, then you will find that financial freedom is just your birthright. Prosperity is your birthright. Say it with me. Prosperity is... My birthright. my birthright. Oh, now you're getting somewhere. <laughs> and so I'm going to just change it right now, okay, so that we can do this right, because that's part of the issue here. Part of the issue is that we start talking about inflation and recession and gas prices and low wages and pandemic and all of these other things, and as that consciousness, that race consciousness, that human race consciousness, as that conversation continues to circulate, we find that the energy begins to spiral down. Spiral down. Why is it spiraling down? Because those are the moments that we forget our mastery and our dominion, our authority over all that is upon the earth of our experience. Amen? And so what we're going to do today is we're going to spin it back up. We're going to circulate it until we find ourselves in the overflow and the overglow. Okay, that afterglow is going to come by the time we pass through those doors and onto our Sunday afternoons. After all, money is only a medium of exchange. That's all it is. And we're, we, we are discovering this now more than ever because um, I'm, it started with me. It started when uh, the euro came to be. I was like, oh, another currency of exchange, another medium of exchange. And then all of a sudden, Bitcoin came up. I was like, oh, another currency of exchange, another way to exchange goods and services and things of that nature. Now there are thousands of ways, literally, and there always has been. But now we are beginning to see what that means when we say that money is only a medium of exchange. But there's, here's the thing about that statement. You've got to have something to exchange in order for money to matter. Did you hear me? Money doesn't matter in and of itself. It only has the value that we put upon it. But you have to have something to exchange first in order for money to matter to begin with. And that speaks to you. That speaks to who you are. That's in the, in the phrase, in the, that speaks to who you are in the matter. So, again, this is something that we, we, we flip the script on, and we need to flip it back. You see, I am the money. I look like money. I feel like money. And wouldn't you want to have an exchange of me? That's the way we ought to look at it. So just go ahead, go right in your pocket. <laughs> but do you get me? It starts with us. And then things begin to 
unfold. And it even starts even deeper than that. It starts with God. It starts with understanding who and what God is, and then who we are in God, living, moving, having our being in God, whereby we then create the earthly economics. Here's the way that Jesus would put it in relation to all these things that are swirling about us, the gas prices and all of the other things. Jesus would say, judge not by appearances, but judge with righteous judgment. In other words, he said it this way too, seek ye first, seek ye first, come on, the kingdom the kingdom of God, and its right useness. It says righteousness, but I like right useness. And then all these other things shall come upon you. All these other things shall be addressed. And so this is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And as I put God first, as I put the Spirit first, then it does something absolutely profound. I'm going to go into what it does in the mix of all of this. But first, let's talk a little bit about what economics are. You might have heard economics, that that term. You might have heard a definition of economics here or there. You may have even taken some economic classes. I know I did in in, uh, college some years ago. And you might have heard these terms that it's all about supply and demand. Anybody ever hear that? You might have heard that economics is about the distribution of resources, yes? And then if you go a little bit deeper, you might have heard this definition, which is a really telling one, that economics is a study of the scarcity of resources. Have you heard that before? And the reason why they say it's the study of the scarcity of resources, because in the economic model or models, anything that is scarce rises in value. Yes? Anything that is scarce tends to have a higher demand and therefore rises in value. Now, that is the earthly economic model. But it doesn't coincide Mm -hmm. with the spiritual economic model. Why? Because there is no scarcity in God. So what you talking about? It doesn't even compute. There is no, that word scarcity is not in the spiritual language. Come on now. And so is there another way of looking at this? There has to be. Because here's why we find ourselves in this downward spiral. Because we are not putting God first in our minds and in our hearts. We're putting these facts and these figures first, and as a result, we are operating out of that information. It may be good information. It may be solid facts, but it ain't the truth. That's what we have to understand in in exercising the economics of spirit. Because anything that is the truth overrides or supersedes facts. Facts can change, but the truth remains the same. The the truth is steady throughout. The truth is, is the real reality, not the relative one. Have you got it? And so we need to understand that as long as we're not putting God first in our mindfulness, then we are 
subject to subject ourselves to these facts and figures that are floating in the atmosphere right now. In other words, we'll start believing things that aren't true, mostly about ourselves. We'll start believing that there is lack in the universe, that there is scarcity in the universe. We'll start believing that there is limitation in me. We'll start believing that there is something to fear. And as long as that is orbiting our mindset, that's what we're going to play out. Because if that's our belief system, then guess what? The system is going to crank out whatever is going on in our minds. We'll start looking for the evidence. We couldn't tell you any differently if it catches a hold that much to your mind. You'll start pointing to it. See that? See that? That's my proof. That's my proof. That's my proof. You will search it out. Even if the truth is right in front of you. Now, I'm right in front of you. <laughs> Do I look like I'm affected by high gas prices? Do I look like I'm in a recession? No. You hear what I'm saying? So somebody's prospering up in here no matter what the news is telling you. Now, if I were you, if I were you, I would search out that rather than the proof of the other. Search out whatever is prospering in this moment. Search out what, because if you search, you're going to find it. That's the whole thing about the belief system. The belief system, whatever it is that you're going to believe, you're going to search for it. You're going to look for the evidence. The evidence is going to appear for you, and the evidence, it, you will find the evidence under a rock. <laughs> You're going to find it because you believe it. Hmm, is this making any sense to anyone? <laughs> so there are three categories of thought that lead to poverty. One is thoughts of lack. One is thoughts of limitation. And the third is paralyzing thoughts of fear. Whenever that happens for you, whenever that happens to you, stop and recorrect. Make some correcting acts. Exercise the economics of spirit in those moments. Recalibrate your mindset so that you don't go looking for impoverished conditions. You see, since consciousness will have you believe that, all, that that's all there is and that's all you've got and that's all you are. Did you hear me? Since consciousness, this way that we have of going solely upon what we see, what we hear, what we taste, and what we smell, and what we touch. We tend to do that. I, under, I get it. I understand why we do that, because that's one of the ways we navigate the earth. It does have a place. But when we think that that's the only game in town, when we think that that's the only thing that is going on around us and in us and through us and, and, and for us, that's when we get in trouble. That's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about sense consciousness. The consciousness that will tell you that what I've touched, what I've tasted, what I saw, what I am hearing is the complete story. It may be just part of the story, but what does the other half of the story tell us? And so that we can get it 
proper, and put it in proper perspective. That's what I'm talking about. Once we have it in proper perspective, now we can utilize it wisely and be a master of our senses rather than the senses mastering us. Because think about it, everybody. God has made this immense, incredible universe filled, teeming with incredible possibilities and opportunities, and made you on top of it. Now, why would God do all of that and not take care of your needs? I mean everything that you require and desire. The God that I serve, the God that I know, that's just, it wouldn't do that and doesn't do that. You see, we take hold of a system and put it in front of people, spin it around, and see if you go for it, if you buy into it. And so somebody, I don't know who, I'm not blaming anybody, any groups or organizations, but somebody... Somebody is toying, they're toying with your mastery. They're toying with your dominion. They're toying with your agency. They're toying with your sovereignty. Sovereignty. They are toying with you to have you think that you're something that you're not. To have you think that you are less than. To have you think that you're a sinner rather than marvelously made. Don't get me wrong, we sin, but that's not my nature. That's out of my nature. You get me? And I don't sin that much now, so... (laughs) That was one right there. Okay. (laughs) Forgive me, Lord. So who wants to know how to have it all? Who wants to know how to to have your dreams come forward? Who who wants to know how to, to, to have every good desire of your heart? Who wants to have financial freedom? Then here's what you do. I'm going to break it down. It's going to be so simple. You're going to say, is that it? Is that all? Here's what you do. Someone told me this a long time ago. It was one of my mentors, Father George Clemens, rest his soul. When he said it, my eyes popped open. It came at a time when I needed to hear it. He said, Eric, said, find a need and fill it. Find a hurt and heal it. Pass the plate. That's all we need to do. No, ushers, I'm not finished. Stay back. But that's all you have to do, good people. The opportunities, the possibilities, they are all around us still. No one has ever taken it away. They can't take that away from you. That is God-given. But right before us, every single day is an opportunity. Right before us, every single day is a possibility. Right before us, every single day is a need needing filled. Right before us, every single day is a hurt that needs healing. Who are you in the world that can fulfill those needs, that can heal that hurt? I know you can. 
I know you have. But we never take it the next step and say, hey, I, can, I got the knack for this. I got the gift. Somebody will want to pay me handsomely to do this. And I would do it for free. All day long, all day long, it's there for us. And so I'm going to get you there today. I'm going to get you there. And I'm going to do it by expanding our consciousness to prosperity consciousness. We're going to do that before I, I come down off of this platform this morning. And I, I know that this week is going to be filled with grace and goodness and blessings and abundance and prosperity for you. That's my prayer. That something clicks and all of a sudden, all of that stuff that we've been hearing and, and toying into and, and contemplating is going to fall away. And all of the things that is awaiting us, all of the good that is awaiting us is going to step forward and we're going to claim what is divinely ours as children of God. And so here's the first thing you have to do. This is the first thing that you have to do. You've got to make some simple de declarations, some simple declarations. I want you to make three simple declarations. Declaration number one, enough. Enough. In other words, I ain't playing with this nonsense no more. Enough. I'm going to stop buying into the lies that would have me out of my, my proper place as a spiritual child of God. Enough. Say enough. Declare for yourself a spiritual emancipation. Enough. Enough of the limiting beliefs. Enough of the lack consciousness. Enough of fearing what if. The second declaration is there is enough. Say it, everybody. Come on. There is enough. Type it in the chat room. There is enough. I'll never forget, years ago, this was back in the 70s, we had a gas shortage. Anybody remember the gas shortage of the, of the 1970s? Back in the 1900s? Anybody remember that? The experts told us that there was only so much oil in the ground. No, wait a minute, that was Tower of Power. <laughs> and they're, expert at their, they're experts at their craft, but that's not the experts I was talking about. But they were saying that there's only so much oil left in the ground, and in 25 years, there will be no more. And it created a crisis like you've never seen before. There were people who caught the fear bug and began to just house themselves in gas lines. You remember it? You remember it? And here we are 50 years later, contemplating on whether or not to do away with gas, although there is plenty, and to go to other more sustainable sources. Look at God. What happened? Here's what happened. Inven invention happened. Imagination happened. Ingenuity happened. And somebody came around, messed around in their laboratory, and came up with the fuel injector. Before then, there were only carburetors. Carburetors, if you were lucky, you would get five miles to the gallon. If you were lucky. 
But with the fuel injector, that went from five miles to the gallon to 25 miles to the gallon. It was a game changer. So what they thought would be done and over with now isn't even in the conversation now. But it started there. And it changed the way we thought about transportation and what was possible. We still got a ways to go because we could be in spaceships right now. We could be doing, uh, there's there's John Jetson. We could be doing that, yes, that right now. If we would get up off of our lack and limitation and fears and just go ahead and do the thing. The technology is here, y'all. The cooperation isn't. Mm. And so the first declaration is enough. The second declaration is there is enough. And the third declaration is I am enough. Simple prosperity declarations that if you exercise will bring forth for you financial freedom and liberty. Independence from all of that nonsense. Get thee behind me nonsense. Mm. But here's more that you can do because it's all in the exercising. The exercising is the verb here. This is the action word. In other words, you got to work it. It works if you work it. And so, yes, you have to state your declarations, especially when you find yourself seeing something other than what you ought to be seeing. You can say what Jesus said and said, don't look at that, don't judge that by appearances, but judge with righteous judgment and begin the process of putting God first. Put God back in place where God belongs. Put it first, put it first, put him first, put it first, put it first. Because once you do that, now these declarations tend to make sense to you. Wait a minute, wait a minute. God made all of this, and there's not enough? There's enough. There's enough. Wait a minute. God has a blessing for me, and I'm not in position to receive it? Enough. I'm going to put myself in position. I'm step right on in it. (laughs) Step right on in position, right in place, ready to get yours, get mine. And then the most important of those three declarations, I am enough. I am enough. Operate from a new belief, a fresh and godly perspective. See things the way God sees it. See things from God's point of view. But then how do I do that? By knowing who God is for you. Now, here's another way that we can exercise this. We can, we can, well, just repeat after me. Repeat after me. This is a nice little exercise. Let's see how it works, okay? Here we go. Are you ready? In other words, now when I say repeat after me, say yes. (laughs) I'm going to make it super simple, okay? Say yes. What do you say? Yes. All right. Just like that. Maybe even louder. If you're feeling it, then definitely say it so that it resonates in your being. Are you ready? Yes. There you go. Is God omnipotence? Yes. Is God omnipresence? Yes. Is God omniscience? Yes. Is God eternal? Yes. Is God infinite? Yes. Is God love? Yes. Is God good? Is God life? Yes. Is God source? Yes. Is God supply? Yes. Is God the center of my joy? Yes. Is God my perfect peace? Yes. Is God my hope? Yes. Is God my deliverance? Yes. Is God my all in all? Yes. Is God my provider? Yes. Is God my protector? Yes. Is God my shepherd? Is God my healer? Yes. Is God my strong tower? Yes. 
Is God my almighty? Is God my everlasting? Is God my creator? Is God my most high? Repeat after me. God is my help in every need. God is my health and my hunger feed. God is my all. I know no fear. Because God, because truth, because I am here. In the name, nature, consciousness, and conviction of Christ Jesus, so it is. And so we are. Amen.